In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Along with the new ways of working and the new ways of being family that we have been learning during this lockdown period, we've also learned a bit of new technical vocabulary, haven't we? And above all, we have learned what the R or R not number is. That rate of reproduction of the virus at each turn of the wheel of its life cycle in the human population. And we know that if it is over one and if it stays like that, then we have an uncontrolled epidemic on our hands. But if it's under one and if it stays like that, eventually it will be eradicated. And so it all depends whether it's expanding through the population to overwhelm us or contracting and withering away. And it seems to me that that is the most marvellously useful model to think of the ways that humans behave, not just viruses. As we allow some things to run riot amongst us, and sometimes that's good and sometimes not so much, while other things waste away, and sometimes that is a good thing and sometimes not so much. And some things in our recent lives have had an R number well above one. In the past weeks, neighbourliness has multiplied in our local communities here in the Cars of Gowrie. One gesture inspiring, producing many more, and we give thanks for that. But other things, sadly, have also multiplied in our nation, like those irresponsible house parties in some places, spreading through parts of the population, egging each other on with their sense of invincibility. And then there are the things that have an R number below one. Perhaps the reduction in pollution, has been thanks in part to the fashion in recent weeks for cycling on our now much quieter roads, a trend growing as it catches on more and more, and one that might just have a long-term effect on the very quality of our air, with a downward spiral, let us hope, in pollutants in the atmosphere. But frighteningly, there has also been a terrible drop in the number of people taking symptoms of other dangerous diseases to their GPs to be checked out, with initial presentations of cancer and heart disease plummeting, in the worst kind of copycat misplaced humility, dragging down the very statistics we most want to see maintained in an effective NHS. Grant from Orchard Hill and Sheila from Echt and Midmar have been considering for us what that concept might mean in the realm of Christian discipleship, especially in these weeks after Pentecost. And a word of explanation for those of you using the audio-only version, the first video begins with a few seconds of Grant pumping up his bike tyre. I'm in my garage checking my bike tyres because of the R number. I know it's meant to predict how many people might become infected, but I wonder if it's a useful idea to think about who might be affected. As I've been out walking for exercise, I've seen many people cycling on the now quiet streets round about here in South Glasgow. Not so much the lycra-clad Chris Hoy look-alike cycling club members, but ordinary middle-aged men like me on their middle-aged bikes. And I thought if they could do it, Maybe I could have started cycling again and on these quiet roads, the five miles or so into Glasgow city centre or out to the hospital is relatively straightforward. That one person on his bike who doesn't know about me encouraged me to get on my bike. Who knows that somebody watching me puffing up the hill might just, you never know, think that it's worth a shot too. And at that point, the R value is around one. And we know just how significant that is. Part of our Christian discipleship is to protect the integrity of creation. It's one of the five marks of mission of the church, which is recognised ecumenically and across the world. And if it's possible at this time of change for people like me to be encouraged to get on their bikes, it might just be that more people can be encouraged and that our value of being affected might just make a big difference. Jesus didn't have a bike and so I'm struggling to tell you that this has any kind of scriptural warrant except if you think about the first Palm Sunday. As Jesus rides down into Jerusalem, I think that a small enthusiastic crowd gather 
And I like to think that one or two others gather because they see the enthusiasm of the crowd. And so it grows slightly. And in the fourth gospel, the Pharisees are reported to be disconsolate about this. See, the whole world has gone after them, they say. Now, it's not the whole world, but what I think is being represented in that short phrase is this sense that as more people do something, it becomes more attractive to others. That sense of affect is not unimportant and combined with the notion of the R value makes me think that the little that I do, the little that any of us does, can make a much more significant difference than we think. So I'm encouraged, even though I'm in the west of Scotland and it's likely to rain very soon, still to get on my bike, I wonder just how revolutionary this might be. Like me, over recent weeks, I suspect you'll have become very familiar with the term the R number. The reproduction number is, as we now all know, a way of calculating a disease's ability to replicate itself and spread. And of late, we've become acutely conscious of the personal and societal implications of whether the coronavirus R number is either increasing or decreasing. But translate the concept of an R number into church terms just for a moment and ponder this question. What are the things in relation to the life of our national and indeed local church would you want to see grow exponentially? Or for that matter, what are the things that you would prefer to see diminish? You might have other ideas, but for me, courage, risk and discernment stand out. And I think they're three sides of the same triangle. In many ways, they're thoroughly interdependent. Were I to ascribe an R number to courage, risk and discernment, I would unhesitatingly ascribe a number of greater than one. In my opinion, the church needs more people courageously dreaming dreams and seeing visions and increased risk-taking that is matched by selfless discernment. Two weeks ago, many of us will have listened to the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, the Right Reverend Dr Martin Fair, talk at Pentecost of the uncharted territory in which, to a greater or lesser extent, the Church of Scotland finds itself at this moment in time. He spoke of the church needing to find its way, needing to navigate a landscape that is now different, following a path ahead that isn't certain and along which we may well be called to leave behind some of the baggage that we've accumulated thus far. It goes without saying, I hope, that courage, risk and discernment are not unfamiliar to those of us trying to live lives faithful to the gospel values. The first disciples were called to courageous action, leaving behind family, friends, livelihood, security, familiarity and certainty. So it does make me wonder what my personal baggage looks like and just what courageous action I am being called to. The courage to give some of my practices a respectful and affirming burial. The courage to let go some of my inherited notions of God or church. The woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment took a risk. My risk taking, our risk taking may well look different, but may well be equally significant. What about risking a redefinition of ecclesiastical success? Or the risk of cutting ties with some of the things in the life of the church which can have an assumed air of permanence? And of course, Jesus made conscious space in his life to think and reflect and pray. In other words, to discern the way ahead, to discern God's will. There should always be an inherent challenge in God's people dreaming dreams and seeing visions. And the challenge is that in every generation, those dreams and visions may well be calling us to different places and inviting us to offer different things, currently unthinkable things, 
in the name of Christ, who makes all things new. So wherever courage, risk and determination are held in a creative tension, or indeed in peaceful balance, I believe that God's Spirit will continue to move and breathe through our church, unsettling, maybe, enriching, certainly, both our faith and the lives of God's people in Scotland. I'll add one more R number example, and I'll take you back to my sermon on Pentecost Sunday, the one about our job being forgiveness in a world that does not forgive the way God forgives through us. If every time someone suffers, they look for someone to blame, a scapegoat to bear their pain and frustration, then the R number of human sin and fault and judgment remains at one, and God's children never become any happier. Every time we choose instead not to bear a grudge, a grudge to which the world tells us we are entitled, and we surprise those around us with an act of godly grace and compassion towards someone who doesn't seem to deserve it, the R number of humanity's anger with itself dips ever so slightly below one. And remember, it only needs to be ever so slightly below one for eradication to be reached eventually. And every time we help such a forgiven person back into the life everybody thought they had forfeited, with friends recovered and fresh opportunities to get it right next time, and that sense of being loved to your core from God at the very heart of the universe, then the R number of the growth of God's coming kingdom edges above one. And remember, it only needs to be ever so slightly above one for that to become a glorious epidemic eventually. So with inspiration, with courage, with forgiveness, with discernment, with a little dash of risk, let us spread those strange habits that mark us out from everyone else. Let us live as those people who make the world curiously and freshly alive with the example and rumour of Jesus Christ, whose we are and whom we serve. Thanks be to God.